All right, so let's uh, do this review of phonation. Um, so first thing, you know, one one large uh, group of questions that you're going to see is about the Bernoulli principle. So um, what happens? Let's see, do I have that set up right? Yeah. Okay. What happens to a fluid when the tube it's moving through reduces in size? So if you look back at the um, lecture, you've got a tube and then the tube is going to go through a, a reduction. It's going to go through a constriction, essentially. So the speed of the fluid is going to increase or decrease. It's going to increase. And the pressure in all non-movement directions is going to do what? So think about this, like the pressure in the direction of the movement, it's going faster. The speed of this fluid is going faster. Remember, fluid could be, uh, for our purposes, water or air. It's easy to visualize water with uh, the straws that I was blowing in, but in the larynx, it deals with air. And air is a fluid. Um, so the speed increases, and so the pressure forward is also going to increase. What happens to the pressure in all other directions, though? Well, those are going to decrease. You can think about it like there's a net amount of pressure in all directions, and it's always the same. So if it increases in one direction, it's going to decrease in the others. And... Um, the direction that the force is most increasing in, the opposite direction is going to decrease the most. So if we're getting a large increase in forward pressure, then we have the most decrease in backwards pressure. But it also decreases a bit uh, in the side-to-side -side directions too. So what about when that aperture uh, becomes larger again, when the fluid comes out of the constriction? What happens to the speed? Well, it decreases. And that means that pressure in all directions, especially backwards, are going to increase back to where they were before the constriction. And so that, so we have a constriction here, and then it's going to get wider. And so if this is where the vocal folds are, fluid's coming through, and then right here, there's less of a constriction here, which means that then pressure is now going to be exerted backwards greater than it was coming through here. So it's going to push back and push the vocal folds back together. Also, a little bit of elasticity, a little tiny bit of gravity, uh, but a whole lot of Bernoulli principle. Okay, um, well, how does the breath... <laughs> We already answered this. How does the Bernoulli principle aid in creating phonation? It pushes the vocal folds closed uh, to create the puffs of air, which create sound. Sound is essentially these puffs of air, this sound pressure wave. You have to set up the sound pressure wave to um, get the air to vibrate uh, to make it to the ear so you can be heard. Uh, and that's what the Bernoulli principle does. The other forces that aid in creating vibration, well, we already talked about that too. Elasticity um, and a little gravity. It's also sympathetic vibrations. I mean, once you get it going, it'll just kind of, it wants to sustain itself. But elasticity, a little gravity, uh, a lot of Bernoulli principle. Uh, and these are pushing the vocal folds back closed after the air comes through to create those puffs of air. How does uh, periodic movement create sound? We talked about this. I already gave this away, too. And remember, it's technically it's quasi-periodic. It's not, not quite exactly a perfect sine wave. Puffs of air create a sound pressure wave. When air comes out, it's compression. When the vocal folds close, that's rarefaction. So you've got this wave of high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. And the speed at which that oscillates between high pressure and low pressure is the frequency. It's the fundamental frequency. Well, it's all the different frequencies because you're going to have overtones in there too, but let's just keep it simple. We'll talk just about the fundamental frequency of the vocal folds. So this open and closing motion of the vocal folds, that sets up 
the oscillation between compression and rarefaction, between high pressure and low pressure. And if you measure uh, the cycles per second of pressure changes, high and low pressure changes, that is the frequency um, of the vocal tone, essentially. Uh, sound travels through the air as a sound pressure wave. Um, and then remember, the sound produced by the vocal folds isn't just a sine wave. We do have, it's, and it's also not a, it's not a perfect sine wave. But it's not just one almost sine wave. It's a complex tone. You've got overtones there with it. If it was just one sine wave, we wouldn't be able to mold that sound with the pharynx, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, all these other things we're going to talk about in the next section. We wouldn't be able to do that if it was just one almost perfect sine wave. We have to have a group of overtones that we can actually mold uh, to create different sounds. And those, those overtones, those harmonic overtones, are going to come out in the harmonic series. What is the harmonic series? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. The easiest series you'll ever know. How are harmonics created? So this question is not, do I have this on the exam? I don't think so. Um, so like it says, the answer is going to be symp sympathetic vibrations of the source, but essentially that um, any tissue that's vibrating, well, let's just stick with the larynx. So the, the vocal folds as they're vibrating are going to vibrate in accordance with the harmonic series. So you can multiply one by the fundamental frequency. Of course, that's just the fundamental frequency. You can multiply two by the fundamental frequency, three, four, five, and these are the harmonic overtones. Those are the harmonics that are created. So everything that vibrates is going to vibrate at a base frequency, the fundamental frequency, and then it's also going to vibrate at these overtones. How much it vibrates at those overtones depends on the structure, what it is. A guitar and a voice and a flute are all different, but they're all going to have some energy at these different um, higher harmonics, these harmonic overtones. Uh, and we talked about this too. These are what the resonators use to turn into formants. They're going to shape those harmonic overtones. Some of them are going to become accentuated. Some of them are going to become dampened. The ones that are accentuated are formants. The ones that are dampened aren't formants. <laughs> we'll talk more about that when we talk about... Um, uh, resonance and articulation. So that last question is not on this exam. Okay, what is pitch? Is it related to frequency? It is, but how? It's the perception of frequency. So there is a frequency. We can measure a frequency. That is not up for debate, right? You can measure it, and then there's no like, oh, well, but it sounds higher. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. The frequency is what's measured. Now, pitch is the perception of frequency. And there is a little bit of debate there because pitch usually is in you know good accordance with frequency, but other things can push around our perceptual qualities. So pitch is the perception of frequency. The fundamental frequency is the lowest frequency. We talked about that already, too. The fundamental frequency, it's also written as F0. That's the lowest frequency. It's the frequency that, um, the lowest frequency in a series. It's the, the basic frequency. It's called the fundamental frequency. What is loudness? This kind of has a, a relationship like pitch. It's the perception of intensity. So intensity is how loud something is. If you're relating it to a graph, it's how tall the sine waves are, the amplitude uh, of, the, of the graph. So again, intensity is something that we can measure. We can see how many decibels uh, a signal is. 
loudness is the perception of that. And again, they're usually in good accordance with each other. Loudness usually follows intensity pretty well, but it can be pushed around a little bit by some other things. Even just the frequency. We have different frequencies that we're more attuned to. The frequencies that are more in the speech range sound a little bit louder to us. So you can play really low tones, really high tones at the same decibel level. They won't sound as loud to us as tones that are played in the, in the speech range. So anyway, intensity is the perception, uh, or rather, sorry, loudness is the perception of intensity. So I came up with a way to remember this, to remember these two. I don't know if it's going to work for you, but loudness and pitch, those are the perceptual qualities, LP. There is a liquor store slash Mexican food restaurant close to campus called El Paisano's, which, you know, back in my day, we abbreviated as LPs. And so that's what goes in you lps you go get a burrito they're huge by the way so lp is what's going on inside of you you're going to eat the burrito loudness and pitch are what's going on inside your head right this is what you're perceiving lp in you uh and then intensity and frequency those are not those are what are going on outside um i don't have as good of a thing for that Fi, like Fi, like Wi-Fi, like it comes from the outside. You don't create it in yourself. I don't know. But LPs is a good one, if that works for you. Okay, so what is the frequency of more versus less cross-sectional mass? More cross-sectional mass, greater cross-sectional mass has a higher or lower frequency? It is lower. If it's thick, it's lower. Greater cross-sectional mass, a thicker thing it's going to have a lower frequency. Uh, less cross-sectional mass, a thinner object, is going to have a higher frequency. What about... Uh, oh, my computer fan just got really crazy there for a second. Sorry about that. What about the frequency of tighter versus looser vocal folds? Um, are tighter folds higher or lower in frequency? Tighter are going to be higher, and looser is going to be lower. So if you have a greater cross-sectional mass, and they're configured in a loose way, that's going to be a very low frequency that you're getting out of that. Similarly, um, really small vocal folds with less cross-sectional mass pulled really tightly are going to have the highest frequency. Um, what happens to vocal folds for some people who sing very high pitched, like Mariah Carey, we talked about this. Uh, she actually doesn't use, oh man, she doesn't use her full, uh, the full extent of the vocal fold. She can actually kind of close it off and use an even smaller aperture here. Um, I think that's an extra credit question, so it's okay if you don't remember that. But also it's in this video, so if you're watching this, you've studied it, so good job. Um... Okay, movements of the larynx. You absolutely have to know these terms. Uh, I mean, for this class and also for like the future of your career. Adduction, closer together. You're adding them together. Abduction, farther away. They're abducted, as if by killers or aliens. Uh, during swallowing, the larynx is going to move up. Okay, let's identify some structures here. So I think the best way to do this is if you pause the video after I point at one of these. So first of all, one thing I need to do is turn on laser pointer. And this one right here, hyoid bone. Only bone in the larynx. Um, this one right here, epiglottis. This, thyroid cartilage. Uh, these are usually on top of the arytenoid cartilages. They're usually just pictured right on top of those. So what are those? Corniculate 
don't get those mistaken for cuneiform. Cuneiform kind of come off the sides here. They're not usually pictured because not everybody has them. Um, and I'm not going to have a picture with cuneiform cartilages to trip you up. If I ask you about them, it'll be in text. You'll just have to know that not everybody's going to have them. They might show up as an extra set of bumps uh, when you're looking in uh, the scope at the larynx. So you'll see a set of bumps. Everybody's going to have a set of two bumps. This is because of the corniculate cartilages right here. An extra set, two more sets of bumps, uh, it's not necessarily a pathology. It, it could be the corniculate or the cuneiform cartilage. Okay, so the corniculate cartilage sits on top of these A-shaped or pyramid-shaped or triangular-shaped structures called the arytenoid cartilages. And this here is the cricoid cartilage. Okay. What is this? It's the notch. It also could be the prominence. I mean, if we're talking about this coming down here, that's the notch. Right out here is the prominence. Um, what about right here? That's the thyroid angle. Again, it, you can call the thyroid angle the outside portion, which you can see here, or the inside portion. I'm only strictly talking about it in this class as the inside portion, um, because that's where the vocal folds are actually going to connect. So that's the important part to know for that. Okay. Um, so this here is the lamina, the thyroid lamina. Um, inferior cornu, superior cornu. Uh, and the cricoid lamina, you can't really see from here. It's, it's on the back. So we'll get another view where we can actually see that a little bit better. Okay, so let's talk about some joints. The cricothyroid joint, what are the ligaments uh, that hold the cricothyroid joint together? Well, actually, let's first take a look at this. Cricothyroid joint is going to be right here. So this uh, thyroid cartilage is going to, uh, if you think about this picture, it's going to kind of drop down right on top of the cricoid cartilage. There's a facet right here. The inferior cornu is going to fit right onto that facet. Okay, so the ligaments that hold the cricothyroid together the anterior lateral and posterior cricothyroid ligaments remember cricothyroid these are named the same thing as the joint and you've got three of them anterior lateral posterior anterior makes sense posterior makes sense lateral is a little questionable so just remember that it also spells alp if you go anterior, lateral, posterior in order, alp. What about the movement of this joint? What does this allow you to do? Well, the thyroid cartilage will fall forward. It'll rotate forward. And essentially what that's going to do, this consequence here, is it's going to cause a frequency change. As the thyroid cartilage rotates forward, it's going to cause the vocal folds to elongate, and that's going to cause a higher pitch. So if you are using this joint, I won't say necessarily one way or the other, but this joint causes frequency change. Uh, because it, you know, you could you could be moving backwards or forwards, but any sort of movement on this joint is going to be a higher or lower pitch. Um, again, I mean, like I've got, like I say here, the rotation uh, is the inferior cornu on that facet on the cricoid cartilage. A lot of the motion is just rotation on that axis. And then there's a little bit of gliding, which can also cause uh, frequency change as well. Okay, cricoarytenoid. This is one of our other really important joints. Cricoarytenoid. Remember this one? 
So we've got anterior and posterior cricoarytenoid ligaments, just two for this one. So if you think about this in terms of like where they are coming down from superior to inferior, like if you're counting and you're writing on like a number line, essentially, you'll go like one, two, three, four, five. So the cricoarytenoid joint is higher than the cricothyroid joint. The thyroid cartilage is pretty tall, but the cricoarytenoid joint is like somewhere within the middle of the thyroid joint. And the cricothyroid, or the thyroid cartilage, sorry, the cricothyroid joint is going to be down here. So two, three. You can just count downwards, like two, three. So in terms of height. Cricoarytenoid, two ligaments. And then cricothyroid has three down here. Uh, they're the anterior and posterior. This one makes sense all the way. AP. So if you remember that it's two and then three, just remember that the one that gets left out is the one that only sometimes makes sense. The lateral doesn't always make sense. Now, what does the cricoarytenoid joint do? This is what it does is a much more important question for the exam than the possible movements. What it does is it adducts, it adducts and abducts the vocal folds. You can vocalize with adducted vocal folds, and you can breathe freely with abducted vocal folds. Um, essentially, they're going to rotate on the arytenoid facet of the cricoid cartilage, so they'll open and close like this. Remember, we have this model. Um, this is the muscular process. This is the vocal process.